Hi, this is Chris. This is Randall. And this is Arts and Entertainment with, with Chris and Randall. Welcome to our show. One day we're going to actually, it's getting smoother. It, Randall, do you think it's getting smoother, that intro? Yes? I hope so. Hey. Yes, yes. Uh, if you think that intro is getting smoother, please leave a comment in the comment section below. <laughs> Though I hope to God you have something more interesting to say than that. Like, as I like to say now, uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you've got any comments on whatever we talk about, uh, if we read it in the first two weeks, we'll try to follow up with you. We might try to follow up with you if it's after two weeks, but I want to make sure that if you're seeing this five, five years later, uh, and you wonder why we haven't commented, it's, it's probably because we died uh, or moved on to other things. But um, this weekend, I watched the uh, Jerry Seinfeld uh, comedy special. Did you see that, Randall? No, I haven't on seen Netflix. it yet. It's uh, called 23 Hours to Kill. I thought it was pretty funny. And uh, it made me realize that, you know, right now is an awesome time if you have access to a streaming service or YouTube to, to listen to a comedy album or watch a stand-up uh, videotape or it just, I think comedy is, is just, it, it's such a tonic. Don't you feel that, you know, when you're having a hard time in life, that's when you most need a good laugh? Yeah, I mean, well, I guess you have to find the right stand-up. I mean, people are like so sensitive nowadays about certain material. Right, but material, I'm saying, so. but when you're not happy or when life is hard, do you find it relieving to hear a good joke or just to laugh? Don't you find laughter to be somewhat liberating in a, in a hard time in life? You know, <laughs> no. It's a lot, you know no, what? It's no, really no joking matters for you, man. No. no, it is, but you know what? It's probably better to watch stand up completely alone because if you're watching with somebody that is not liking a joke That's and you're laughing point. at the joke, you know, I mean, right. have you ever if had that experience? In, well, okay, here's the deal. If I'm at a live stand up show, and I'm drunk, and the people I'm with are drunk, then we're all on the same room. Especially if I'm in a live stand-up show, and everyone in the audience is laughing, so you're just gonna laugh because you're a good little sheep. Or if you don't, the comic, and I, I'm that guy. I, Sebastian Mancuso, I was at the, the comedy store, and he just looked dead at me, and he said, I bet you didn't think you were gonna be at a comedy show tonight. And I was like, dude, you're just not fucking funny. Uh, sorry, I know you guys sell out, Madison Square Garden, but were you sitting in the front row? Uh, middle enough, I guess, that he could see me not laughing at him going. Whereas my friend was like laughing, ah, oh, you're Sebastian, you're so fucking funny. No, you're not. I, look, dude, I can say that you're selling out Madison Square Garden three times, three nights in a row. I'm just one person who didn't think you're funny. Uh, so yeah, I've definitely been that guy who just stood stone faced. Yeah, some comics, know. some comics are very sensitive to that. I mean, yeah, not all. I, I, yeah, it, it's. I guess that's the point of crowd work, too. I mean, a comic can do a lot more to win over a live audience uh, than they can do on a taped show. It's very weird, too, because I was going to, I'm jumping, I apologize, folks, but there's a really funny Mark Marin comedy special uh, called End of Times Fun on Netflix. And I actually was in the, I'm in the audience with my girlfriend. We're in the front row, the left side. So I remember watching it laughing really really hard and having a good time and then i watched it on netflix it's really funny i definitely recommend it but yeah it is a definitely a different experience and you're definitely more aware of the person in the room well i saw it with the same person i saw it live so it was no different experience for me but it's weird when no one else laughing besides you <laughs> where at least when you go to a, a live show even if the person you're with isn't laughing with you there are other people out there. though in fairness most of the time i'm the guy going is this really funny uh wow we're getting so far afield which was well it's just i guess yeah, I said, so we all use a good laugh we like stand up uh randall growing up who were your big stand-up comedy superheroes who were well, the ones that you will the young well, randall would listen to to get through the day well of course eddie murphy you know eddie murphy uh, was me too i loved him Oh my God! Yeah, you well, you would have been what? Like, uh, you would have been like a little kid. 
uh, he would have been what six when he was on eighty one. It was like it was like, when I was in elementary school and Eddie Murphy hit. It was like it was huge. Yeah, I mean, kids and I was in stuff. high school and in college. And in high school, he, in eighty one is when he was on Saturday Night Live, and then I think eighty two is when he put out Comedian or Del- Delirious. Uh, and we would just quote it, you know, like you boy, you look good in them jeans or lemonade, that cool refreshing drink. You know, it was a uh, it was obviously a very nerdy thing to do, but uh. We did say these were our superheroes, didn't we? <laughs> well, you know, Eddie Murphy, he, uh, he, uh, he practically defined modern stand-up comedy. I mean, it's like probably well, people, he, kids today probably don't even understand that. Like, he, he was very, uh, he, was def- he was very funny. I mean, he was a very dangerous guy. Uh, he, he, he was one of the first comics to lean into the, well, he wasn't one of the first. Uh, Richard Pryor is really, he, he comes out of Pryor. Pryor is really the first one, and he was a big hero. I'm 10 years older than you, so I guess Richard Pryor to me would have been what Eddie Murphy was to you, meaning I knew Richard Pryor through a lot of the softer stuff that he did when I was a kid. Like, he was in the Silver Streak. He'd do movies with Gene Wilder, or he would be on television, and he would tell very – he had a variety hour. and It was funny, but in a softer way. And then I would, like, read – listen to his albums and his albums were explicit in and in, in race and sex and drugs and uh well comedy wow. um, comedy and albums. eddie murphy too eddie murphy his albums are much more out there than when he's the voice of the donkey on shrek <laughs> well comedy albums uh have been big business for years right since since the beginning well i don't know since the right 50s but at I'm least. Saying, and, and they're they were for me growing up so for me growing up, I really should have started with me. I'm sorry, man. I, I was trying to be polite, but because I'm 10 years older than you, it doesn't work because the chronology works with chronology. So like growing up for me, there were the HBO specials, but we just got HBO. But there wasn't a lot of comedy specials. There were a lot of comedy albums that were recordings of people doing concerts. So I would like, really dig Robert Klein, a very 70s comic, and then I get his album. Or I would dig David Brenner, another very 70s comic, and I get his album. And uh, as a kid, man, I would just listen to like the prior albums. And I think the one that really kind of, it was weird, because growing up, those guys were all established already. But I remember when Steve Martin broke on Saturday Night Live. And I'm like, this, this guy, like the perfect comic, for a young kid because he wasn't really talking about sex and drugs, which I have to admit, as an eight-year-old, I did not have a lot of sex or drugs yet in my life. It wasn't like, you know, I couldn't relate to that. Yeah, his routine jokes. was very accessible but, for kids. Right. You know? It was like, I like to get small, you know, or uh, he had a song about King Tut, you know, and he talked about getting kittens and putting handcuffs on them and uh, what to do when you, how to make a million dollars without paying taxes and then the irs comes to your door you say i forgot and and stuff like that he was very steve martin and then like almost like five minutes after steve martin robin williams from mork and mindy who put out a comedy album i think in 79 i cannot remember what it's called i just remember it was something like live at the copacabana in new york and it's a robin williams and Steve Martin could not have been the more perfect two comics for children. You know, uh, Gary Marshall's son was the one who recommended uh, that uh, Gary Marshall cast Robin Williams as Mork. Uh, anyway, yeah, so as a kid, I would have to say Robin Williams and Steve Martin were like the perfect. Before Eddie Murphy came around, they were like the big, perfect stand-up comics. They just killed me. Were you a fan of Robin Williams? I remember watching, because uh, uh, Robin, I think you're talking about Robin Williams an evening at the Met in 1986. Well, that I was think... later down the line. Oh, I'm talking about did... his 1979 album at the Copacabana in New York. Oh, okay. But this is the Robin Williams that is more known for Mork and Mindy and not, and not the guy who did any movies. But 1979, he was a movie star Robin Williams. Yeah. 1987, that's a great special. He's movie star Robin Williams. But go on. I might, I might have this one wrong, but I think this one, uh, like I watched one with my mom, like he had been on Mork and Mindy and I watched it with my yeah. mom rented it or something and he's super dirty. And- yeah. 
he has this whole routine about uh being a penis he acts out being a penis uh oh yeah yeah no that was true oh here's yeah. one an evening with robin williams in well, 1983 which, which is the one that you were talking about that you saw that really kind of hit you the one that i was embarrassed by but with my mom it was probably an evening with robin williams in 83 this is the one yeah. san francisco's so, uh, great american music did, hall did, 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 did you uh did you uh i was gonna say did you uh watch it on what was that, on hbo or something so no, we rented it we rented it my mom we just got a vcr and like yeah. when i was a kid we just got a vcr and my mom started renting stuff at the video store and uh you know, probably the clerk told her this was super hilarious, which uh, <laughs> it was in parts. And, you know, my mom would rent it because she rented it because it's Robin Williams, you know, Mork. And yeah. uh, uh, it was embarrassingly dirty. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you, because I, as I said with my mom, like my mom was totally good with uh, letting us watch and she would enjoy watching dirty comedy. So was your mom the same way? No. Well, your mom's Jewish. What does that have to do with anything? Well, I mean, my mom's like British, a Brit, good br British woman. You know, she's like very uh, she's more uptight about stuff like that. You know what I so mean? It's like, she did not enjoy. Uh, she didn't. Uh, she did not enjoy uh, the Robin Williams special. No, she didn't like it at all. No. <laughs> it, was, it was way too dirty for. Her. I think we watched it all, hoping it would get better, but it never got yeah. better. It just got worse and worse. We might have turned it off when he started pretending to be a penis. You know, I, I, I will definitely say that... Uh, well, actually, you know what? You met Robin Williams. He, uh, you, sort of, yes. Tell, tell us about that. What, you met one of your heroes. Well, about a year or two before he died, he... Uh, he has a friend that kind of is in the uh, L.A. improv scene, uh, stand-up scene. What's his name? Uh, God. Anyway, it's a friend of Robin Williams. He's an old st Rick Overton, and Rick oh, yeah, Overton, Rick. Yeah, sure. Rick Overton. You know, he 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 hangs out in the theaters around L.A. The I.O. West used to hang out at before it closed, and uh, I.O. West and um, U.C.B. on the Sunset and uh, um. Well, not on Sunset, on uh, Franklin. And, right, uh, right. So you're... Anyway, Robin Williams, he did a surprise improv show at, well, I guess one of them, the, the IOS one was like planned. He did, a, he did an improv show at the IOS. And this is a couple, a year or two before he died. And he did one at the IOS and he did one at the UCB Franklin. Yeah. And uh, the UCB Franklin was actually, I guess, but maybe it was a couple of years even before. It was like maybe four years before he died. Yeah. And... Um, the house was packed, man. It was packed. Everybody came out to see him. Uh, the iOS show, I took his picture, you know. Uh, I was the iOS photographer at the time. So yeah. I took his picture. And um, yeah. um, he did improv. He did improv both shows. So, you know, he was – most people never got to see him do improv. He was kind of like a legendary improv improviser back in the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know people who did improv with him. I had an improv teacher who started out with him, uh, Cynthia Segetti, and she would tell all sorts of stories about Robin and how great an improviser he was. Well, um, it was fun watching him. <laughs> did you did you talk to him? He was, at all? you know what? Did you did you speak to Robin or did you have any uh... No. No, he was a very nice guy, though. He was a very nice guy. He 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 seemed he seemed like he was uh, uh, fine with hanging out for a little bit, but you know, it's like, um, he was a nice guy. Yeah, I mean, he you know, he was he was a very short, small guy, huh. and he was shy. You could tell he was a shy guy. Yeah, and it didn't seem like he was the kind of guy you would. You might think, but he he didn't seem like backstage. He wasn't the kind of guy that wanted to be the center of attention all the time. Yeah. You know, like he seemed like the kind of guy that uh, would just be shy and be a wallflower. So he, you know did, what he I mean? didn't really seem like the guy that you had grown up laughing to. I mean, well, he wasn't. That, the, was that, I mean, like, I guess on stage. He wasn't the guy on stage. Improv, he is like when you saw him doing improv live on stage with these people. Was that like watching the Robin Williams that you grew up with, your hero? 
Yes. Well, he on stage. And then as soon as he gets off the stage, it just the magic. Yeah, he gets off stage and uh, he has nothing to say. Well, is it? I mean, is it like the Hulk where he just goes back to being Bruce Banner? Or something? Yes. Yes. It was like that. Um, he's um, larger than life on stage, and then. Well, you know, yeah, the but funny, he's a nice guy. Go the on. funny, the funny thing about Robin Williams on stage is, uh, I think, I think he was a performer. Like you could see it in his improv shows. He he was a performer that very much uh, was in tune with the audience. He knew what the audience wanted. You know, when he was doing, because I've seen other celebrities do improv, right? Yeah. And they. I have uh, too. You're right. It's sometimes it's normally disastrous. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's just I've seen an Academy Award winning actress and one of the great contemporary alternative stand up comics, who I didn't even realize is not even on our list. Uh, uh, what is his name? For Mr. Show. Bob Odenkirk? No, the other one. Oh. <laughs> he's on Arrested Development. Right. I can't remember uh, his name. He's a very funny comic. And everyone else is going, they're shouting his name right now. <sighs> but anyway, I saw him and Hilary Swank both at the Groundlings do improv. And Hillary Swank won an Academy Award for Best Actress. So David Cross. David Cross, thank you so much. And uh, and neither, I mean, they're both very talented people, but regardless of their talent, they're just not very good improvisers. But Robin Williams, on the other hand, he is well. Like, you know, I don't think he was that great of improviser. But um, no, you didn't I mean, think he was a genius. Well, you know, every time I saw him do improv, it was like. It wasn't like he had been rehearsing for weeks. He just got up, you know, so, to do improv after like I don't know, yeah. a ten-year hiatus. So you know, it was not, more he was than rusty. Just, but, he was rusty. He didn't know the people he was improving with. But yeah. you know, in spite of all that, he yeah. he, he like I was trying to say, uh, he uh, he was in tune with the audience. He 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 knew what the audience wanted. You know, so like uh, some some see some celebrities. You know, you know another thing. Uh, see, some celebrities are afraid. You know, they'll hang back. You know, they'll let the, uh, they'll, they'll try to come up with something good. You know, they don't want to like fall on their face in front of the audience. Yeah. Robin Williams was, uh, and you know, he was, he was at the end of his life. He, you know, he had a, had a long career. He had done a lot of improv. So he was completely fearless on stage, you know? Oh, uh, well, he was definitely in his prime as a performer. Uh, that is so cool. I did meet the other hero, uh, Steve Martin, and it was nowhere nearly as cool a story as yours. So I'm going to tell it very, very briefly, uh, because and it's sad. I love Robin Williams. I, I think I love Steve Martin just a little more. And how you know that, Chris? Well, I actually bought his book, Cool Shoes, which was not very good. But I, I read it, and I didn't understand it. But I still love Steve Martin so much. I saw all of his movies. And uh, so in the early 90s, I'm living in New York City. Now, New York City, I'm living in Manhattan in an area that doesn't have a lot of gyms. So there's this new gym called the Equinox. I spend more money than I've ever spent in my life to join this gym. Eventually, I won't be able to afford it, but it was like I had just a little extra money on me, and I wanted to be a good-looking young man. I was like, fuck, I'm going to join this gym. So I would always go at the odd hours when no one would be there because it was just packed. So I'm there one day, and what do you call the, there's like three machines, and they're all next to each other. They're all like for upper body, you know, like the lat, lateral. Lat and, pull uh, down, maybe? Lat pull down. Yeah, like lat pull down. All the different like lat pull down machines. Okay. It's been a while since I've been in a gym that had those machines. So that's why I don't remember it. But it's just me. I'm doing my reps, and there's. A, one other person there, I realized, staring at me, who is trying to work in <laughs> at the same time, but he's got a different, like, at that time, I would just use all the machines one at a time, and I wouldn't even do, like, I, I didn't know what I was doing, so I just could spend forever. So you're I'd like, hey, out. Mr. Martin, good to meet you. I got 15 more minutes. Fuck you, fuck you for stepping on my, <laughs> fuck you for doing that. Fuck you. All right. So my point is, yeah, it is Steve Martin, and Steve Martin in real life is actually taller than Steve Martin in the movie. Steve Martin's face is bigger. 
Steve Martin would have been a giant stage actor in the 19th century. And I mean giant in both height, even though he's only six feet tall, and in presence. So like, it wasn't like meeting somebody and thinking, oh, that kind of is like that. But no, it's fucking Steve Martin. And Steve Martin is looking at me, and he's looking at me in the way that anybody would look at you in the gym when they're like, dude, like, hurry that shit up. And I'm like, I'm feeling two things at the same time. One is, I'm a god. I can't believe it's Steve Martin. And the other part of me is like, I have to concentrate on what I'm doing or I'm going to break my hands, you know? And I do need to do my reps in a certain amount of times. But I remember my trainer said, you have to pull these things down very slowly to get the maximum benefit. So I'm like, you know what, dude? I'm, you're, you're no one. You know, you're just a normal person. You're no different than me. You're no better than me. I'm just going to ignore you. So as I'm pulling it down, I'm looking at my, ignoring him. And I'm just going to look at my chest. And then I realize, oh, yeah, I'm wearing a Three Amigos t-shirt. And for those of you who have no idea what I'm referencing, that is a movie with Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short. So, yeah. And that, that's the only experience I ever had with Steve Well, Martin. you didn't even Don't talk ever... to him? No. Oh, hell no. And he didn't speak to me. No smiling. I don't know if he was mad at me for taking so long. Now I realize maybe he was just mad at me for not mentioning the fact that I had a Three Amigos t-shirt and he was waiting for me to say something. Probably he was waiting for me to say something. Maybe he thought you were wearing wow. it ironically. You know, uh... No, it was 1991, so the movie was about six years old. You know, he probably was wondering why I didn't say anything about the fact that his face was on my chest. <laughs> wow, I don't remember what the show was supposed to be about, but now it's taken on a whole other darkness. There. Hey, that reminds uh, me of a story, a brief story. I uh, went to a David Lynch uh, book signing. Yeah. And uh, I was in line, you know, I went up to him and I got to say a few things. I told him what I always want to tell him is I love the movie Dune. Yeah. And he looked at me like uh, I just thrown cold water in his face like he didn't know he like he couldn't understand what i was saying to him because i think i think he uh you know he's completely disowned that movie you know it's a great oh, movie yeah. but it was huge in japan okay that's a little joke there always but um it's true um no i, I hear you I, I once went up to uh i'm a big fan of elvis Costello and the attractions and i went up to uh i, I met the drummer after a show where they played like every freaking song in the entire Elvis Pres Elvis Costello songbook. And I told him how awesome it was. And then I thought it was even cooler that they played a song that didn't feature that drummer because that was the one that he knew about the attractions. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he was like, yeah, that's a sore point. And without really saying, dude, conversation's <laughs> over. It was very clear conversation was over. So Aww. yeah, uh, folks. Uh, and I did meet James Chappelle very briefly. He was roommates with a friend of mine. He was a very sweet guy. And I have absolutely nothing to say about Dave Chappelle because he was such a sweet and nice person. That that's, It brings us into, I guess, what can you watch uh, right now? And you can certainly, if you like Dave Chappelle, there's no shortage of Dave Chappelle specials available on uh, Amazon and YouTube. And I'm even assuming Netflix. Uh, there's even the Mark Twain special, which features a number of other comics. Uh, I Can like. I just did say you, about did, Dave Chappelle? Did, did you watch the special? Not the Mark Twain one, but I just want to say about Dave Chappelle. I Chapp recommend it. I just want to say about Dave Chappelle. That's the perfect thing to watch completely alone with all the windows closed so nobody knows you're watching it. <laughs> <laughs> because, because you never know how somebody's going to take Dave Chappelle, right? I mean, there's some controversial you're, you're stuff. Basically, he says. now basically, they say that Dave Chappelle is like watching animal porn. Is that what you're saying? It's <laughs> something that you you don't want other people to know. That's your deal, man. I'm saying that uh, Dave Chappelle's uh, stand-up is going to be banned by the government eventually, and you don't want to be on a list. So watch it and see. Well, I mean, being banned—that's always what made comics. I mean. Carlin had what the seven words you can't say on TV. And, you know, that's always one of those things that, you know, comics are, uh, but it's a, yeah. I, Carlin's I, another I one. Seen, I haven't seen everything, but I did see on the special, there's like Sarah Silverman, Neil Brennan. Uh, is Chris Rock on it? I think Chris Rock was on it as well. But if you just want to watch a lot, it, actually, it is on Netflix. And just, I'm going to say this. So if you want to see, uh, 
Aniz Azari, Neil Brennan, Sarah Silverman, John Stewart. If you want to see them do stand up, uh, notice I didn't say Bradley Cooper because he's not very funny. Yeah, there's Science nice Dave Chappelle, there's Chris Rock. There are so many. I, I, I've actually been to a couple of the live tapings of the Netflix shows. And Netflix has really been putting a lot of time and money into doing these shows. I just saw, as I said earlier, uh, Jerry Seinfeld's, uh, what was it called, 23 Hours to Kill, it just came out. That was a nice show. It's just about an hour long. Uh, Ronnie Chang, I thought was very funny. Uh, I mean, yeah, there are other channels you can watch. Uh, I definitely, uh, but yeah, I really did like that there are so many that they taped in the last year because I guess if you ever feel with comedy that uh, you want to see the most recent shows? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes comedy really dates itself, right? You know, have you ever listened to like uh, some of those old comedy albums, like especially? Uh, Oh God! What is it? Maze? What? What's that comedy team? It was a man and a woman. Uh, uh, Elaine May and uh, yeah, May uh, May Hodge, uh, great <laughs> film director. I yeah, Elaine May uh, and, and Nick, Mike Nichols. It's a great yeah, film. Nichols have you ever listened May. to those? Absolutely, I have. Are they funny? <laughs> I feel uh, like I, I, I'm like so far gone from that funny. era. I they can't, I barely no, understand they're, they're it. They're funny. Nichols and May is really funny. Nichols stuff. and May. I mean, uh, I always heard for years how good it was. And I would, I, and I'd put it, it, it's funny, but it's dated. I would say that Bob Newhart, who's from that same era, is a, also funny, but not all of his material is as dated. Uh, Red Fox is from that era. You know, Red Fox supposedly was one of very in the world funny, of comedy album. And never did. He's very vulgar, but in the world of com well, in the world of comedy albums, his albums sold like crazy, right? Yeah. And yeah. I listen. I tried to listen to some of the Red Fox, and uh, he seems kind of dated to me too. I mean, I I don't know. Maybe I don't know what it was. Well, about. all of it. All of it's a product of its time. Though I would absolutely recommend anybody who wants to listen to good 1960s comedy, check out. Nichols and May, Red Fox, Bob Newhart, even the more straightforward George Carlin of the 60s versus the hippie Carlin of the 70s, the one who does a uh, really funny bit on the difference between baseball and football. You know, Carlin... Did you hear that one? Yes, yes. It's great. Um, it's genius. It's just genius. Well, Carlin is like, I think his style never really... I think Eddie Murphy, like, might have changed stand up in the respect that uh in the sense that uh after Eddie Murphy's huge success in the eighties with stand up, uh stand up became like shorter and punchier and more punchliney and, you know, uh less storytelling, you know, and uh uh so like George Carlin, I think, you know, he's he's an old he's an old guy, right? So he doesn't he's not really like Well that, Carlin, you know? Carlin Carlin happens in two acts. There's George Carlin clean shaven, very funny, witty, clever guy of the 60s. And then there's a the long haired, scruffy bearded George Carlin, anti establishment guy of the 70s, who is, you know, much more out there and much more. They're both very clever men and they both, their material isn't that dis different from each other. But just like imagine if Jerry Seinfeld decided tomorrow morning he would never wear a suit again and he would just wear like resist t shirts and a bandana. And he would just do a whole thing on like, you know, what's wrong with Wall Street? You know, who, who, are, who are these investment bankers? You know, <laughs> why isn't there health care? You know, well, true, but Bernie Sanders all the time. True, but I just feel like some of the old style of comedy was very long winded, you know, and Carlin, I think, is well, maybe a great that's example just your of age, that. You know. Well, I'm not criticizing. I I'm just saying stuff. that. I, it doesn't there's the material like you're saying. Eddie Murphy was much tighter. Yeah, it's very tight. Yeah. I mean, Eddie Murphy's stand-up specials were so tight. I mean, kids would quote him on the playground. You know, I mean, because that's was, true. And it was much easier to quote Eddie Murphy growing up than any of the other comics. Yeah, did any kids quote uh, Nichols and May on the playground? I don't think. I don't well, think. that's my mom's era, so yes, and your mom's era too. But I don't think they did though. But I don't think I quoted <laughs> Steve Martin. Oh, I've quoted Steve Martin a little bit. You may have. He was he was but, fairly but tight, Martin, some of his material. Steve Martin and Robin Williams were gentle, and they were appealed to the pre-teenage me, whereas like teen me 
thought Eddie Murphy was dangerous. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, you know, Eddie he Murphy, was, he also a fire. <laughs> he also well, he also brought that attitude to stand up. You know, he acted like yeah. a movie star. He dressed in a leather suit. Yeah. Raw. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, he was yeah, he he was uh he was a he rock was a star. He was the first rock star comic. And you he know, was very much yeah, I agree. And, and and even in the movies, even though we don't really talk about the movies too much, he brought that persona into almost everything he played in the eighties. You know, whether it's forty eight hours or Beverly Hills Cop, you know, until you get to the late eighties with coming to America, he really is just he took that Eddie Murphy from the stand up. You know, he's just that that badass. Maybe this was coming out of left field, but I think the only other stand up I can think of that brought that kind of energy was uh, Eddie Izzard. You yeah, know, because and Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Izzard very much so. I agree. Because Eddie, comedy yeah, specials, uh, Dress to Kill, is I think uh, one of them on the list. And you know, if you can find any Eddie Izzard comedy special, I think you're going to find it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen and Eddie like, Izzard live. I would you know, say like Eddie Murphy. Oh, really? What was that like? Well, I've seen Eddie Izzard live, you know, recently, and you know he has gotten much more like like an old school comic where he he's he's more long winded, you know, and he's more storytelling, yeah. and he even does uh, pictures now. He does slides, like you know, a slideshow and things. He talks about his childhood. Uh, he gets autobiographical. Uh, so I mean, he's really uh, broadened his performance, you know. But his early stand up, yeah, is very it better now and, or just different. Well, I mean, it's it, yeah, it's different. I mean, uh, it's different. I mean, uh, you know, it's hard. To, it's hard to uh, well, his stand like if 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 Eddie Izzard, if early Ezzard, Eddie Izzard didn't exist, <laughs> yeah, then old Eddie Izzard would be amazing, right? But because old Eddie Izzard exists, it's like, uh, and you compare it. You know, old Eddie Izzard is incomparable. Old Eddie Izzard is some of the greatest stand-up ever. I mean, well, there are very course. few stand-ups, I would argue, who maintain that edge all throughout their career. I can only think of a handful. I do think that Carlin never lost his edge. I think Carlin, if you watched even his latter comedy special, he was always he always knew how to tell a good joke, and I think he always cut well. I, I actually think Jerry Seinfeld is still pretty tight, even at 65. I mean, if you watch the comedy special, he opens up with one of his oldest jokes ever about how people are always trying to go from one place to another and they're never there. It's like he's been telling that for 30, 40 years. But the way he tells it now is still funny and fresh. And that's, it's funny and fresh, and it's an old joke. So, yeah, there's some people, even Jay Leno, I think Jay Leno is still really good. Uh, if you ever listen to uh, Rodney Dangerfield or Don Rickles when they were on the talk shows at the end of their life, they were still, the timing, they just, you know, I, I think some comics, what happens is they just walk away and they take up acting and they become more serious. And when they come back, they're just... I don't know. Maybe the persona is just not there anymore or something. They didn't evolve, you know, but I definitely think it's a good question. I, I would ask you is why is, why is, uh, why is Jerry Seinfeld still, do you first off, do you like Jerry Seinfeld? Yeah, of course. Uh, his, uh, so why is he still funny crazy. today? Uh, yeah. You know, you sound like a stand up comic. You always do a bit on their hair, uh, but why is Jerry <laughs> Seinfeld still funny today? You know, why is that humor? I, I would argue it has an age because I don't think he was ever very topical. You know, he rarely talked about presidents. He rarely talked about what was going on outside of the regular day-to-day life. You know, it was much more about, you know, uh, talking about the human behavior, which hasn't changed much in all of history. What do you think? Yeah, well, he was... Uh... <sighs> Yeah, he was, um, well, people call him the master of observational American-style humor, American-style observational humor. And, uh, you and know, that comes out of Carlin. Well, Seinfeld was really good at, and you tell me because you've seen his latest special, he was, he was always really good at uh, putting, being very tight, right? Having like a very yeah. tight uh, delivery and punchline crafted together. And um, yeah. 
So, I mean, so, I mean, in that respect, you know, uh, he's, he's very, very modern, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he's not like a Dave Chappelle, you know, Dave Chappelle is like very storytelling E. <laughs> you know, with well, his delivery. it's weird because he does do that, but it you really like if you watch the special, he did a neat thing where he does about a half hour about uh, about you, the audience, and then he does a half hour about himself. So it's not all you know. Hey, this is what it's all like. He's like, you know, I'm 65. Here's what I do now. And then in the middle of this, he does this whole bit on the origin of the pop tart, and he basically compares. He, he does a bit that might as well have been straight up either Carlin or even for that matter, it might have even been Bob Newhart, where he, he, he imagines what it was like when they invented the Pop-Tart at Battle Creek, Michigan at Kellogg's. And he talks about what it was like growing up, which reminded me of Billy Crystal. Then he does a whole thing with Moses. And instead of the Ten Commandments, it's the Pop-Tarts. So it is actually the kind of stuff we never think about when we think about Jerry Seinfeld which is, is not just observational, but exaggeration, imagination, uh, all sorts. And he uses his body fluidly. I mean, he's a Seinfeld? great shape. I, absolutely, absolutely. He is in good shape, and he throws his arms, he marches. He uses a suit, and he uses a suit for full comic effect because the suit is kind of tight on him, and it, it makes him stiff in a way. And, yeah, his body is constantly fluid, you know, I saw Mark Maron, great show, but he never left his seat. He was sitting down most of the time. He does use his body a little bit. He does get up a little bit, but Maron is much more planted. Yeah, Mark Maron. Seinfeld's not a planted comic. He's like, which is weird, because you would think that he's planted because you're so used to thinking of the ending of every episode of Seinfeld. Well, you know, that's just done for TV. Well, yeah, on TV, they used to tell comics, if you're on TV when they're shooting you because of the camera, they'd tell you to plant your feet. You can't move. You can't walk around. You know, it's, it's like a shooting thing. You know, it's like it's technically difficult to follow you around. But now with lighter cameras, I think it's not a problem. But yeah, in the yeah, olden days... Yeah, now just follow you wherever you go. In the olden days, comics had to uh, stay, stay there, stay right in that. Um, Which is great if you're a dead can comic. You know, <laughs> it's like if you watch Stephen Wright, it's a joy to watch Stephen I just Wright. wanted to bring um, up Stephen Wright. Clip. He's one of the greatest underappreciated comics. Yeah. I don't know why. Absolutely. He is, he, he, I don't know. He's, he, I mean, he's been doing stand-up for years and years, right? I saw his HBO special when I was a kid. I mean, I don't know why he's not huge. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he just didn't want it. But, I mean, he's probably, he's, he's possibly the funniest stand-up of all time. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> he's up there. Well, he is, he's very funny in a particular way. You know, and I, I think it's fun. You know, I'm very lucky. My girlfriend is a stand-up comic. So even when I was watching Seinfeld, I'm like, why is this funny? Why is this working? You know, or when I saw Marin, the same thing. I said, why is this funny? Why is this working? Because, you know, I'm not a stand-up comic. So for me, it's like eating a really good cake. You're like, why does this taste so good? But when you talk to a stand-up comic, it's like talking to a baker. It's like, well, I think, Chris, what you're re- reacting to is the flavor of cinnamon. Or how good butter tastes in vanilla, you know, or the vanilla syrup, or the layering of chocolate. Like there are, there are, there's a process and a structure. So I think that uh, some comics are very funny because they're very dry. Some comics are very funny because they're very emotional. I think it's possible for someone like myself to love Stephen Wright, who is so deadpan and surreal, right? That great joke about. Uh, he's got a job interview and he said, let me ask you a question. If you're traveling at the speed of light, how do you know if you've got your headlights on faster than the <laughs> speed of light? Right. Like, I'm not very productive. You know, oh, that's he was conceptual. Right. So I love conceptual comedy, but like Dave Chappelle, I'm a pick on him or Chris Rock. They're not concept. We don't think of them as conceptual comics. They might use conceptual work, but it's, they're normally talking about what life is like today. And it's not very conceptual, but I like both. Steve Martin was never a comic to talk about what life was like in the here and now. He's crazy conceptual. I find him funny, but he's zany, you know. What about Carrot Top? <laughs> I hate Carrot Top. I don't like Carrot Top. If you like Carrot Top and you're watching the show and you tell me that I'm being mean about him, then I'll say, 
you probably like Gallagher, and I don't like Gallagher either. Prop comedy. Is hard. No, I was a kid I when I was a kid. When I was a kid, uh, yeah. Gallagher was huge. I mean, everybody was he, really? he was basically huge on VHS. Everybody was renting his uh, his cassettes, you know, his tapes on VHS and watching them at home. And uh, people loved him. People loved him. They loved it. Crush that watermelon. Yeah, when he broke the watermelon, people loved going to the show and getting watermelon juice spilled on them, and uh, it was a whole thing, you know. I, I mean, I feel bad because I I know that I'm a comedy snob. And I know the downside of being a comedy snob is like, I've never seen Larry the Cable Guy. I've never seen Jeff Foxworthy. You know, there's a lot of like, if you've, you've got never puppets, seen, You've I'm never seen watch, one Jeff Foxworthy? You know, no puppets, no ventriloquists for me. Jeff Foxworthy's uh, first HBO special where before he was big, you know, the one that made him big, it's yeah. really good. It's really good. It's, it, that's the one where like, he, okay. he's, he talks about you might be a redneck if and all that. If, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm terrible that way. I'm, I'm definitely, and I, I have a harder time with young comics. Like the youngest comic that I really dig is John Mulaney, who I believe is in his mid to late thirties and tells jokes with people in their fifties. He's great. I love him, but I, I mean, I've been going to stand up shows, you know, as recently as when I was in New York this past Christmas, and I'm like, I don't think this is funny. And I, and I is maybe it's age too because I think what young stand ups find funny. Are, are things like, hey, I remember the first time I got high or drunk or, you know, what it's like to try to have JoJo. Like, their comedy, I think, is often told from the perspective of the comic where they are in their life. So it's no accident that the middle-aged comics are much more relatable to me than a young comic. I don't want to hear about what it's like to be in your 20s or 30s or, or even your, yeah. I don't want to know, you know, because to me, all I'm dealing with right now is middle age. So all I want to do is listen to comics who are either dealing with middle age or who are dead now. And I can watch clips of them when they were middle age talking about being middle age. You ever feel that way? Like you just want the comics that can speak to your own experience? Um, my experience is or not Are you funny. more broad minded? <laughs> <laughs> are you, but I mean, I don't mean to be an asshole because, like, obviously. Well, you know, it's interesting you should say that because there, because one of the great. Like, aren't you going to listen to so and so? She's brilliant. She's from Nairobi, Kenya. She grew up with no arms. She's, well, we just uh, talked a about multiracial Kenyan, you know, or whatever, and she's a communist. They're like, no, I don't, because unless she's truly, truly funny, most of what she's talking about, I can't relate to. So well, I grew I up watching a lot of stand up for that. Well, we both must have grown up watching a lot of stand up because we were growing up during the uh, 80s comedy boom, right? Yeah. And we saw a lot right. of that stuff. It was on TV um, and in the clubs. And uh, there were a lot of comics that nobody's ever heard of. A lot of people did comedy. So I'm sure you saw comics that like were like that, you know? That, And, you know, uh, uh, there was a lot of funny stuff going on. I mean, you know, people were. Um, yeah, I mean, I saw a lot of comics who had a completely different life experience. I mean, look at Eddie Izzard, right? His early stand-ups were uh, really great. I mean, he, he talks about a completely different experience than uh, what you or I would have had. Um, yeah, I guess so. And, and if a comic can really find the universality, I'll connect. You're absolutely right. I love Trev and Trevor Noah's stand-up. is hysterical. I don't know. I, I don't really... I with Trevor Noah. I don't really... Fine. I don't really look at these comics. I don't look at any of these comics. You know, I, I rarely look at people in the media and think, oh, yeah, they're just like me. I, I don't know. Maybe other people do, but I never really well, have that's, that. Well, I think it's also because no one's like you. <laughs> <laughs> that could be, but, no, but I never but really have that impression. The only, the I only, mean, maybe there really aren't people like you in the media. Maybe. But the only, I mean, I, I, had a, I felt a connection to Kurt Cobain a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading Catcher in the Rye and thinking that Holden Caulfield was like one of the only characters I actually could connect with and relate to, like, which is, you know, something I heard other people did with other books. And I no, was, I mean, you're, I you're raising about. a really good point, which is in comedy, I guess you're right. I don't mind if the comic is different than me. There's a lot of comics I like or women comics or who are not Jewish. Com well, are there any non-Jewish comics that I like? Well, yeah, Steve Martin's a non-Jewish comic. <laughs> so yes, you Gentiles, can be funny at times, uh, and and God knows everyone who is not Caucasian has the opportunity to be much funnier about 
Caucasians and Caucasians. So yes, I like everybody who can be funny. I'm just saying that as I like with music, it's just you're going to have to try a lot harder to find where you and I have a common thread in order for me to laugh at you. And if you're coming from a world that I can't relate to, that doesn't mean you're not funny. It just means I, I can't relate to it. And, that, and I definitely will say, more than anything, there's probably comics who are just so much older I can't relate to, and there's so much younger I can't relate to, or whatever it is that is their point of view, I just can't relate to, or I find offensive, or I don't find offensive, but I just find dull. You know, like Sebastian Mancuso, I'm picking on you because you're an asshole to me. I just don't think you're funny. I think you're, you're funny, but you're not fucking brilliant. So there's probably some comic out in the world that you don't get. Is there a comic out in the world you don't get? Uh, that I don't get at all. Yeah, like, um, I don't want people like that comic. Well, usually I can look at people's act and I sort of get what makes them tick. Uh, I used, when I was younger, I, I, I would have trouble, but um, you know, I've seen now, now I kind of get it. Even if I, even if I don't like the act, I, I understand that there's, yeah. there's an audience, you know? Um, I'm trying to think now. Uh, well, no, I, I don't know. I, I sort of get, I sort of get most of these acts. Um, no. Can I just give a shout out to some comics I like? Like, uh, well, I'll, t- I'll just give a shout out to one last comic. Uh, oh, G- first, Jim like, are you going to put out a shout out to, to, our, to our friend, Jim Gaffigan? Yeah, he's awesome. It's not really a shout out. It's more like a recommendation. Okay, yeah. so Jim I Gaffigan. I was so worried because I got to say right now, first off, Kelly Spillman, greatest comic, and it's my girlfriend, but even if she wasn't, greatest comic alive today. Okay, so Chris wants to make a recommendation to watch his girlfriend. Um, where can yes. people watch her comedy? When she's on a streaming show. Or on YouTube. But okay, so you awesome. gotta wait. You gotta wait then. Okay. Well, no, I'm thinking Google her and you'll probably Google her, you too. can find stuff. All right. Kelly Spillman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh I just wanna say, like, if you wanna watch something with your family, yeah. You know, uh the funniest clean comic I think is Jim Gaffigan. And I know you don't even like him. I think we talked about him earlier, but No, I don't dislike him. I'm just I'm not uh, no. I just I think I don't I, yeah, I hear he's great. He's probably funny. And I would and I'd add to that. The funniest clean comic I like is John Mulaney. Yeah, John Mulaney, he comes up a lot. So those two guys are like, and you can watch them with your family. Right. They're the funniest clean comics you could watch. Like, if you want to sit down and watch stuff with your kids. Yeah. That's probably those two. Um, Should we end this show? Because it's like, we should end this show. All right. Well, (laughs) first off, before we end the show, what did you guys think? Is there a, a comic that you think we're wrong about? Or is there a comic we didn't mention? Or is there a comic or a comedy special you want to recommend? No, we didn't do comedy movies. We didn't do sitcoms. We didn't do any other kind of comedy. I promise you, we will cover all of those things in good time as long as we're still alive. Uh, but right now, it's just about comedy specials, not even comedy albums. Uh, I do want to give a shout out if you want a raunchy thing on YouTube. You can listen to Richard Pryor live on the Sunset Strip. No watching it. It was a documentary, but you can listen to it. It's freaking genius. Uh, please like and subscribe. I'm Chris Corbell. Randall Mills. Thank you for watching. Bye.